Hi, Monica. Hi, Laura. So um, good morning, here. everyone. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself first? Sure. Um, I'm Monica Bernales. I'm the Global Marketing Director and Sally Hansen um, with the Cody organization. And I'm Laura Reigert. I lead the CPG org at Google. So very nice to see all of you. Thank you so much for doing this. I am, I've, I've had an opportunity to get to know Monica and hear her whole story. So I'm excited for her to share that with all of you. So if you want, go ahead and kind of talk through your journey on how you got to Sally Hansen. Sure. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Um, thank you for having me. It's a topic that is very important to me. Um, it's a personal uh, uh, topic that is, is important. And the reason I say that is that I, not always live in the United States. I was born in the Philippines and I pretty much started my career with Unilever almost straight out of college. So I worked with Unilever. I was in the foods business during that time. And I had the opportunity to uh, move to the personal care side of the business with Unilever and then based out of Bangkok for a couple of years before eventually moving to um, Singapore for a few more years. And I landed in the US, um, based in New York, um, working on an amazing brand um, that is Dove. So really taking that journey from Asia to the US was I think one of the most uh, pivotal moments in my career, uh, professionally as well as uh, personally. Um, and Laura talked about my personal story. And I think one of the things is that I've always worked um, in my corporate life in a global multicultural organization. Um, and that was amazing. But I think that moving to the US, I quickly realized that I'm a minority here. I did not look like most people. I did not speak like most people. And honestly, it took me a while to feel comfortable just getting up in front like I'm doing now, because I was consciously aware that I spoke a bit differently. Um, and so I think that was quite interesting because I was having that journey for myself and then working on such an amazing brand that uh, Dove, which some of you may be familiar, um, has really been one of the brands that was at the forefront of changing the conversation and how we um, represent women in advertising. Um, when the Dove campaign for real beauty was launched, it was, I think, marketing term disruptive um, at that time, but it was also um, polarizing in some markets and in some geographies because I think we were just not used to seeing real women in advertising at that time. I think we were served up such like an idealized version of um, what we thought beauty was supposed to look like that it was a bit jarring for everyone um, to see real women in our advertising. And so I was very um, fortunate to be part of that journey. And that's something that the brand still continues to um, do until now. As, I've, as I see on media. And that was sort of, my work on Dove was in the foundation for the other future work that I started doing on Vaseline and then eventually moving um, out of Unilever to um, work on CoverGirl and now in my role in Sally Hansen. Amazing. And out of curiosity with your, with your um, growing up in such you know, different countries, do you speak more than one language? Are you yes, I speak English. I speak my mother tongue, which is Filipino. Um, I also speak a dialect, which um, is quite similar to Spanish, so I can pick it up a bit. I'm not fluent. Um, and because I live in Thailand for a couple of years, I was um, quite able to speak Thai. Um, but because it's been so long and I haven't had practice, I'm like, I've forgotten most of it, uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah, but for those of us who grew up in the U.S., unfortunately, most of us only speak one language, and that, I think, is a real attribute to you. So while you grew up or you moved to the United States feeling like an outsider, I'm jealous, right? And, and I think we can, many of us are probably still feeling that of, of wow, you get to understand completely what they're saying. I have to, I have to depend on translate, right? And, and, uh, or ask questions or try to follow along. We were talking last night at dinner and we were all talking about our kids and sports, which is a very normal conversation amongst parents when you're talking, but you never go, so what, 
languages are your kids, you know, studying or can they, you know, are they immersed in anything? And, and I think it's an opportunity for us to, to really start thinking about what um, immersion and empathy can look like if we can start putting a little bit more emphasis around being multilingual. I digress. Okay, so based on your experiences, um, it sounds like you've created a foundation that is really important to you. Can you share a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I think that because my experience in global in brand marketing has been a lot to do with global iconic and heritage brands, right? Like brands that have been there forever, brands that have been passed on from one generation to the next. I think it's challenging for those brands to be figure out what the future means for them in this day and age. Like, I think um, brands that I've worked on have been on this journey of defining how to be relevant in today's um, time and how to reach out to the consumers in a way that makes sense for them. And so if I look back and all the work that I've done, I have adopted sort of key pillars or principles that I, I use to guide some of those decisions. And I look at it in three ways. One is from a brand perspective. The other is as um, in a consumer lens. And the third is as a marketer. Um, and I think the first piece when it comes to brand is that it goes back to authenticity. Um, authenticity is, is really key for a brand. I think often we think that oh, you wake up one day and you're just like, I'm going to be in this inclusive marketing space because that's what everyone is talking about. And I'm going to create this amazing campaign and develop all these assets. But the truth is, it doesn't work like that. I, I think that as a brand, you have to earn the right to be in that conversation. Um, we've seen a lot of brands make that same mistake. And it's a journey, as um, Olivia said earlier, right? Um, I think all of us are in, in this journey as brand marketers that I think one of the key things is really to actually take a few steps back when we think about our brand marketing efforts. And I think it goes to defining and figuring out what your brand DNA is. Um, it's so far behind even thinking about what a brand campaign idea looks like. Um, it's figuring out what the nuts and bolts are of a brand, what makes you unique, what is different, what do you stand for, which then defines what your purpose is as a brand. And I feel that that weaves into everything else that you do, that weaves into your product philosophy. How do you develop your products? Are you going to be clean? Are you going to be sustainable? Are you going to cater to a specific product need or benefit um, that, that serves a certain demographic group? Um, and that goes back down to your brand DNA. Um, and that's super important because without that, you can create the most amazing campaigns, but you'll get lost. You'll either get lost as a brand, you'll, you'll forget what your tone of voice is, or you won't be distinctive because you're just like everybody else. And right now that's the key, right? Like to win in marketing, you need to be a distinctive brand that truly stands for something. So I think that's one, that's really the key to be able to connect with your consumers so they believe you um, and, and it needs to come across as an authentic effort. Sure. And then what's two? Okay, two. Um, two is all about how you connect with your consumers. So I remember when I was like, really, I don't know, in my 20s, starting my career and you do, you do, do all these like tests, right? Like strength finders, Myers-Briggs, personality tests, like all these team building stuff. Um, but I remember one that particularly like stood out. Um, it was a strength finder, I don't know, 1.0, I guess, very first version. Um, and one of the strengths that popped up for me was empathy. And when I got it, I was like very disappointed. I was like, what? <laughs> what does empathy mean? Like, can I be a visionary? Can I be like a problem solver? Can I be the leading edge, like kind of strength profile? And I was like, I was bored with what I got. And I remember the moderator came up to me and said, um, actually, if you are to be a good marketer, that's a key strength that you need to hone and continue to build on. 
And I didn't think much of it. I was thinking that, oh, this person is just trying to make me feel better. Like, mm -hmm. thanks. But no. And I think after a few years now, I look back and I'm like, that is so true. Um, that is absolutely 100% true. Because now I realize and what keeps ringing in my mind is that, yes, we're all consumers. We buy things, we consume things. But you are not your consumer necessarily, right? And it's so important that you're able to put yourself in their own frame of reference. And as we now see newer consumers, the TikTok generation entering into um, the marketplace, we might not necessarily understand them, but it's crucial that we're able to look at things from their own perspective. Um, and so for me, that's the second piece. Like if you're able to connect with your consumers, that's key. You don't have to think like them. You don't have to agree with what they're saying, but you have to look at it through their own lens because that's really the only way we can gain insight. Um, and I think the third piece is with regard to how we are as marketers. Um, inclusive marketing is something which is very important to me. But often I think when we look at, um, and I, I had the same indication before, I was like, well, that's the organization's job, or that's only for somebody who leads a team, who manages a big team, or HR, or a DEI expert. Um, but the reality is that everyone in this room has that responsibility, right? We need to be inspired leaders. Because if that inclusive culture is not present in your organization and your team, how does that, how will that translate to the brand that you're leading um, and translate into the efforts that you're doing? So it, it's, it comes full circle. It's like understanding your consumers and then taking that and breathing that into the organization to truly impact um, the brand, which becomes front facing to consumers. That's great. So when we're thinking about campaigns and you're, and you're kind of building on those pillars, particularly with authenticity and empathy, <clears throat> you're going to need a, a, a strong connection to your consumers, right? You're going to have to build that personalization with them. Can you give us examples of how you, how you do that? Yeah. So I think in, um, there are the more traditional ways, right? We, we do consumer groups, we do the calls, reach out to consumers. And those are, those are super valuable in terms of getting you know, that in-depth insight and quantitative data. But I think um, somebody mentioned earlier, TikTok, social media. I mean, that's um, relatively new um, in the marketing space, but that's free information because those are information that your consumers are handing out to you. And if we only take time to listen. Um, so I think that's one. Um, but also for me, because now my role is um, very much focused on innovation development. And one of the tools that I encourage my teams to look at and what I do are product reviews. So product reviews, service reviews, any review that the consumer puts out there. Um, and it can be any .com, it can be on like an Amazon review or your own branded website. Those are really great nuggets of information. I've gotten, I've developed so many products out of those reviews or developed like changes to products that are out there sure. from those product reviews. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one. And I think the last piece too is um, your consumer hotline. If, you, if your organization has a consumer affairs hotline, ask for a report um, from those folks and go through it. Doesn't have to be intense, just read through it quite quickly. You can, like, there are some great information in there, mm -hmm. um, which actually reminds me, um, story on Dove, when I was on that team, we actually develop a whole campaign just based off a consumer affairs letter uh, or a letter from a consumer that landed on her table really um that we develop a whole commercial out of it and it was an authentic story it came from a consumer we couldn't have made it up if we Do you remember what it was about yes yeah, so um somebody else here was working on me working mm -hmm. me on that so essentially there was a mom who wrote to the dove team and said 
I love Dove Bar. I've been using it for how many years? And I've passed it on to my daughters and their daughters have passed it on to theirs. And everyone looks that we're so much younger than we are. Mm -hmm. And that was literally in the letter. And we got hold of the letter and this, this is brilliant. We couldn't like make up any campaign that this is that good. Um, and so our agency partner then went to the house of that consumer and we shot a TVC out of it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't make it easier. Yeah. Right. I think that was Amazing. one of the most um, uh, exciting times, like one of those exciting uh, TVCs that we've shot. I, I, when I was getting started first in CPG, I live in Cincinnati and was working very closely with Procter and Gamble and had the opportunity multiple times. They let me sit as a guest in their call center. If you haven't done that yet, I can't tell you how much you can learn by listening to the calls come in just for a few hours. They'll tell you if they're taking the time to call and granted, obviously in, in the new world, they probably won't. Um, but, you know, back when I was starting, when we, in, in call centers were, were the primary connection, um, you learn a lot from those call centers. So I agree with you completely. Current events is another way um, that, that we're seeing consumers react, right? So there's a, there's a direct um, response, I think, in social media and how consumers are behaving based on what's happening in current events. Can you pivot quickly when you need to based on you know a, a sudden change or something happening? Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we try to do it. Um, it doesn't always work. In, in, in some cases, right? I think there are, especially when it comes to assets, like if it's a TV asset that is out there and it's not working or something happens, like you, you can pull it, but that's an asset that's not good anymore. I think with the rise of digital and social media, there's obviously more opportunity there mm -hmm. um, to do that. But I think that it is imperative. We do need to pivot. I, I think that's one of the, the challenges that all brands have to, um, figure out how to how to do that effectively and efficiently move quickly yeah so i'm assuming there are adjustments that need to be changed to be made based on geography of where your consumer is located right so when you think about authenticity and empathy do you have a different mindset <clears throat> based on different regions of the, of the world where they are yes absolutely i think you know, when I've been working on global brands, uh, we would develop specific assets for the different markets. So in Asia, for instance, or the US or even the UK, um, these are very different consumers. And we know that even if we look at the United States, one state is, is very different, mm -hmm. right? Um, in terms of what they're looking for, um, some of the values, et cetera. So um, I think from the global side, we develop, how we work is that we develop a global campaign, but then we have several iterations of that and we do that in one go so that it becomes adaptable to different markets. And that's the same case for whether it's a TV asset or an Instagram or a digital asset. Cool. And then on your third foundation pillar, uh, inspired leader, can you give examples of, if I was on your team, what would I see in, in Monica and, and how are you, um, you know, how, any tips we can take from you as an inspired leader? Sure, I think it goes back down to knowing what we don't know and, and really being open to learning and not rejecting anything. Um, I think that's how I approach things. Like I might not understand everything, but I want to hear the stories. I'm I'm big around creating space for people to share their stories because that's what that's how I view my job as a marketer, mm -hmm. right? Like when we create all these amazing assets and TVCs and and um, social and digital assets, that is essentially stories that you're creating from consumers. That's their story that you're playing back to them. Those are the things that they're looking for that you're playing back to them. So it's the same way in terms of how I manage teams and how I interact in teams. I listen to their stories. Um, I make sure that everyone has the opportunity to speak um, their truth and, and have a safe environment for them to be able to do that. So psychological safety is sort of primary. Absolutely. Amazing. 
Well, Monica, I don't have any other questions. Are there any other kind of closing remarks or anything that you have before we uh, open up to the group? Um, no closing remarks, but Laura, I'm just curious because you work in Google um, and we're always curious to see what um, Google is also um, finding out. Like, are, what are some of the insights that you're seeing when it comes to the inclusive marketing space? Well, for sure, CPG is going through a major uh, pivot right now as an organization or as, a, as an industry. Um, creating that closeness to our consumers, we have the same ones, right, is the most important thing that we can do as, um, as, as we help our CPG customers like Cody, like Danone, and like so many others, is really making it easier for you to understand who your consumers are, where they are, create that personalization. You talked about, and we've heard about all these different ways, you know, through social media and through a contact center and through all these different ways, but right now, they're sort of pillared. So you have to go here, you have to go here, you have to go here, you have to go here. So what we're really challenged on right now is to say, okay, how can we make this easier for you as a brand leader to go to maybe one place and really have all of that to be able to say, okay, now I understand where he or she is. Now I can understand how to reach them, where they are, the way that it's fast, easy, what have you. I think in general, um, the future of marketing and advertising is, is going to change quite a bit, right? You're going you're gonna to be owning that own data. You're going to be able to figure it out on your own, less dependent on the agencies, less dependent on you know, third party, and being smarter about who they are by, by having that yourself. Um, so that's, I think, the biggest thing that we're seeing right now and thinking through, okay, how can, how can we help you with that? And, and uh, I, I think a few years from now, it's just going to look completely different, the way that you advertise, the way that you market, the way that you think about your consumers. Great. So. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Anybody? Testing. Hi, I'm Sarah from Cargo. Nice to see you again, Monica. <laughs> um, I'm just curious, you know, when we think about diversity, a lot of times we're thinking about different types of skin tones and backgrounds, um, like cultural backgrounds, but are there other different types of inclusivity you're thinking about, like different shapes and sizes and body types and things like that? Absolutely. I think that's the skin tones is just one area, right? Like it's a tip of the iceberg. I think there's a whole other, um, there's so many other aspects to it. So a body shape is one. Um, I think the whole, the inclusivity also should speak to the LGBTQIA efforts, right? That's absolutely in there. Um, and I think the cultural background, as you said, but I think it's, it's really all about the individual, right? Um, and that's why when Laura mentioned personalization, we're so far from that right now as a CPG organization, um, because we're so used to developing campaigns that are broadcasted in a mass way. Um, but I think it, it boils down to that. It's the, um, the whole you do you kind of approach, which seems very, a slogan type, but that is what it is. Um, and that's how um, things are in marketing. That's the way we're moving towards. It's respect for each of the, the individuality. 